during Earth's great tectonic age. The landscape you see now was undergoing a violent transformation. Sandstone, compressed and heated under immense pressure, formed quartzite mountaintops, reaching heights greater than today's Rocky Mountains. But after two billion years of erosion, all that is left are large, rounded white hills, today called the La Cloche Mountains. Breaching through the pine and hardwood forests and marshy lowlands, these hills, according to legend, were used as warning bells by local indigenous tribes, as striking these quartzite rocks could be heard from a considerable distance. When early French voyagers came, they named it after the French word for bell, la cloche, hence the name today. Killarney Provincial Park straddles this mountain range and is a natural playground for the adventurous who wish to experience some of the most pristine wilderness Ontario has to offer. Starting our canoe trip, we couldn't have asked for more perfect weather. The afternoon sun reflecting on the lake like it was a sheet of glass made for quite a serene experience. And something told us this was only a taste of what the Ontario backcountry had to offer. The journey consisted of two separate portages, one 80 meter and a second 400 meter portage, from George Lake to Freeland Lake and finally to Killarney Lake where we would set up camp. After canoeing for the better half of a day and arriving at camp exhausted and dehydrated, we decided to set up the essentials and make a quick dinner. The forecast was calling for wind and rain on Sunday, so we knew tomorrow would be a busy day foraging for supplies and setting up the remainder of our camp. With a last minute reservation change to our campsite, we managed to grab one of the best spots in the park, Campsite 15, which offered us panoramic views of Killarney Lake and the surrounding landscape. Thank you. 
As much as we wanted to relax and soak in the tranquility of this place, we still had to set up our tarp and collect and split as much wood as possible before tomorrow's rain. So we had a quick breakfast and got to work. Part of the reason we packed so heavy was how much food we brought. Following Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you could say, we didn't want our hunger getting in the way of the enjoyment of nature. Another possible reason is, our best friend Tom is a professional French chef. On the menu for our fire-cooked dinner was coal-seared Ontario strip loin, fire-roasted baby yellow potatoes, fire-grilled Cajun chicken, and smoked Italian sausage, accompanied with sautéed mushrooms, onions, and peppers. No one said you can't eat like kings while backcountry camping. Perhaps a form of ancestral memory from eons ago, there is something deeply therapeutic about sitting around the campfire with your best friends in the complete wilderness, gazing up at the stars and pondering life's greatest mysteries. Sunday's weather forecast rang true, but Saturday's hard work had paid off, as we were well equipped at camp and prepared to leave for a day of canoeing and hiking in the cold and rain. As my friend Nick likes to say, everyone is there for the sunshine, but no one is there for the rain. And that's when the forest comes alive.
Reaching a high point on the trail, the grandeur of the park reveals itself, and it's easy to see why the famous group of seven cherished this place so much. As Lauren Harris once wrote, no man can roam or inhabit the Canadian North without it affecting him. Monday morning, we packed up and began our long journey out of the park. We were leaving behind the splendor of the Ontario backcountry, but bringing home with us a sense of accomplishment and also a deeper fulfillment. Real adventure is wild, unpredictable, and self-determined. It's about facing the risks of the unknown and pushing your own boundaries so you can experience life in a more profound way. But most importantly, real adventure is best done in the company of friends, because all we leave behind are shared experiences.